So, um, the first speaker is Martin Ross, um, who is South West Water's environmental um, manager, and he's going to speak about identifying PEZ opportunities. And Martin's been one of the main instigators um, of the catchment management pilot projects um, that first started between 2005 to 2009, and that then extended and expanded into the upstream um, thinking projects, and is now um, developing um, catchment management projects um, in advance of PR 14. So I think we've got probably the best speaker to sort of start the session after lunch. So over to you, Martin. Thank you, Helen. My mission is not to put you to sleep, so I'll try and keep you entertained for my 20 minutes. Um, a special welcome, obviously, to our French colleagues, and what I've got to say hopefully will show lots of parallel messages, similar problems, and ideas about how to resolve them. I come here with two hats on. Although I work for South West Water four days a week, I spend a roughly a day a week with the Rivers Trust movement as a board member, and it's part of the business of knocking down silos. If there's a big silo, you just join both camps and work for them at the same time, which is great fun and keeps me from getting bored. So I'd just like to take you through some very simple things. What was the background? What made us start to think about dealing with the problem where it arises? rather than trying to deal with it where it arrives at a waterworks. A little explanation about the pilot work, and for which we're very much indebted to third sector colleagues, and I'll make sure I mention them all. And then a bit about off what's role, that's the economic regulator for the water industry, and the way we'd like to see paid ecosystem services develop. So that's your agenda. So the background, um, that's uncontrolled pollution. I don't think it's meeting any regulatory standards, but it was all built before asbestos cement roofing was invented, which is the only good thing you can say about that picture. And then there are these kinds of things, and if there aren't people out there regulating, then we have to try and turn that somehow into drinking water. And the conventional response is to have to spend, so far, £30 million downstream at our waterworks in the last five years, putting in activated carbon. So you'll know that that takes out taste, odour, pesticides and all kinds of things. And for each of those six cells, when it needs regenerating, we have to shovel it out, drive it to Stoke-on-Trent to be regenerated and drive it back again. And that's costing us about a quarter of a million a year just to do regeneration quite apart from running the rest of the works. So for our French visitors, I thought you might be amused by this little cartoon from an extinct newspaper back in 1988, and the big worry was that um, the English water authorities would all be bought up by the French. It's sort of worked, but not entirely. Um, some of it's Malaysian, some of it's Chinese, some of it's got Japanese investors and so on. But the thing I wanted to say about the two models between England and France is that the, the community, the, the, the region and the municipality still own the assets, but the running and the maintenance and improvement of them is franchised out to what we think of as a water company. But Mrs Thatcher, in her wisdom, decided to sell the whole thing lock, stock and barrel in a distress sale before the European Union came and sued us for the way we were running the industry. So, that's by way of background. Um, one of the things I wanted to mention is that storage is very important. And if you live in the southeast, you don't have enough storage, and it makes life very difficult if it doesn't rain. Um, we depend on three big uplands in the southwest and then a combination of river releases and reservoir releases to make our systems work. Our rivers are very short and they're very steep and as a result something that happens upstream gets to us maybe in an hour, maybe in half an hour or maybe in a day. So there's a very quick response when something goes wrong in those catchments that we depend on. And to deal with the resource problem that we'd had endemically. This is the timeline of reservoir construction in the southwest in Devon and Cornwall. From 1861, one of our assets was built, I should apologise, by Napoleonic prisoners, but we're very grateful to them for that work. <laughs> it's still in daily use, as is Dartmoor Prison, also built by them. But you can see here there was a little bit of burst of activity in 1898 when Plymouth was running out of water and a little bit of work in West Cornwall in 1965 when Cornwall was drying up, and then we had to wait until 1979 to get any real action. 
And that's what happens. We had constant hose pipe restrictions and difficulties. But with those big reservoirs now, we've got choices. And we can decide how much we use from a river, how much from a reservoir, and balance the quality of the water coming from each, which is where upstream thinking comes in. A few things to make you lose sleep if you don't sleep very well already is about the global warming forecasts. Some quite interesting stuff here about loss of rainfall, um, long after I've checked out, but it'll be someone else's problem. But there's a whole sequence of events here that mean that if we think it's difficult now, we're only just beginning to tackle the challenges in front of us. And so we have to do some very fast, very radical changes to keep in touch and maintain supplies for our customers. So the pilot work. We have a little small reservoir between Devon and Cornwall on the north edge, on the River Tamar, and on a good day it looks like this. And there are just 13 farms above it, and I talked to Dylan right at the beginning of puzzling out what to do about deteriorating water quality, and Dylan said, we can go and do some work on these farms, and when we've done it, the rivers won't know there's a farm next door to them. And I said, you're kidding. And it's absolutely true, it's worked, and that's what happens. Those 13 farms have been put right and they don't damage water quality any longer. And it's a brilliant thing. And before, we used to have the farmers spreading their manures the way farmers have all been trained to do, right up to the edge of the reservoir, so you can see the dark stains to the right, and you can see a bright green edge to the reservoir where all the blue-green algae is starting to get going. And that is the most expensive water to treat in the southwest of England. Um, probably by a factor of two times compared with our cheapest. And it was purely because that land-water-reservoir interaction wasn't being managed. And we only had 25,000 to do that work, but West Country had contacts and through the Tubney Trust raised 230,000 to put everything right on those farms that were affecting it. The other bit that we've got to uh, think about is the way the moorlands are drying out. And since the drought in 1976, they've completely lost the old ability they had to hold and retain water. They've structurally changed, and so we're trying to make up for that loss. And we've got our special humpback workers who can put in these excellent structures, um, and they can put in about 50 of those in a day. So it's really quick, very simple engineering. It's just up. And then we put in bales of millennia, which is moorland grass or heather behind it. And that whole system gradually builds up, pushes the water out sideways and does the re-wetting work. And from water that used to go down that stream in 10 minutes, it might take a week. And that takes the energy out of the water and stops the water eroding. and means it can't do so much damage further downstream. So it's very much the Thames water love every drop idea. Or is that a deferral one? I think it's a deferral one. Anglian, thank you. I knew it was someone's. <laughs> but the principle is you start where the rain starts to fall at the very top of the catchment and then you work all the way down, dealing with each problem as you find it. So those two bits of pilot work and along with work by uh, Cornwall Wildlife Trust in the far west of the county, here you can see the number of pesticide detections that we've been having since we've started to engage with the farmers and say, did you know that there's a really important waterworks downstream of where you're farming? Did you know you're losing valuable pesticide into the river, which costs us a lot of money to take out? Can we not talk to you about minimising your pesticide use and getting it really tuned and accurate? Because that will make you better off. And it's the argument about being better off that works for farmers just as it would for any other business. We do annual reports on what we're up to. So these are some measures of... Um, vegetation growth on Exmoor and the ones on the left are the ones that like wet ground and I think probably you'd agree they're getting better and on the right are the dry indicators and they're declining which is great news. A little bit about Offwatt's role then and paid ecosystem services. Traditionally the government has approached this problem of pollution of water and all the ideas about meeting water framework directive by raising taxation and then putting it into various schemes to make improvements. Our contention is that the water company customers, subject to consultation all the rest of it, affordability, are actually very well placed to look after the water that they receive because it's in our customers' interest to give them 
the most treatable, most sustainable water. And so you can probably read the main messages here, but better water quality is easier treatment for us. That postpones the upgrading of water treatment works, and that's the big killer for us, is the interest and debt burden, as well as the operating cost of more expensive treatment. Five pence on our customer's bill raises a million pounds to improve the environment, and I know of no other financial system that's as powerful as that, subject to getting illegal, but this is a legal process. And this programme we're doing at the moment, this five-year period from 2010 to 15, is a £10.8 million investment in our catchments, where we get water from, and that's adding 65 pence to the bill. The willingness to pay from customers was £1.80, so we've used up a third to get this programme going. This is a brand new slide, and it's off our current uh, customer research for the next price setting, which is a key part of what we have to do to justify the next programme. And a number of those blobs relate very closely to upstream thinking. So customers are willing to pay for improvements rather than a lower bill, which is a very important point, to maintain a safe supply. On the second blob down at 95%, they want resilient and reliable, even water supply, even in extreme conditions. So that's something that catchment management deals with as well. Minimising interruptions is another one for water resource reliability. And the last one is about no water resource restrictions. And we can start to really guarantee that if we have catchment supplying water very gently and extending the active life of our reservoirs. So this is the work at the moment on the farmland areas, along with some work on Dartmoor and um, Exmoor. The principal delivery partners for the farmland work at West Country Rivers Trust, as you'd expect. Cornwall Wildlife Trust that I've mentioned, and also Devon Wildlife Trust, who are doing work on the three pinkish blobs towards the top of the picture. But each in their own way are really significant pieces of work. It's the water industry stepping way out of its comfort zone. It's taken some selling internally, but I've had a lot of support there, and continuous backup from South West Water Board. And that's been what's made it possible to do this program and then lots of discussions with investors as to why they should invest in a water business that's trying to do things and not just ratchet up the bills, because that is an ethical business. If we can control the bills and control the complexity of our business, that's my idea of an ethical water business model. For the next five-year period, by introducing things Lawrence mentioned about sewage works and flooding, protecting our customers from environmental um, excursions, Sorry, I'm speaking too quickly. I finally noticed. Apologies. Um, this work from 2015 to 20 is about looking at a wider set of interactions between catchments and our customers, how much they pay, and how we can protect them from future bill increases. Quick word on, on paid ecosystem services. This is a paid ecosystem service. This is um, an overwintering barn put in on one of the farms right next to one of our reservoirs on Exmoor. Just through the gap to the right of the barn you can see some water with a nice layer of wheat growth from nutrients on the edge of the bank. That's Wimbleball Reservoir and previously the cattle were outwintered in the fields and occasionally indoors and allowing nutrient and mud to get into the reservoir through the winter, feeding blue-green blue algae. And by providing this barn, we put up 40% of the cost. That's now made that farm able to overwinter the animals for maybe six months. And as a result, all of the manure that's produced in that period is captured, controlled, and can't escape into the environment. And we're looking forward to seeing the nutrient levels and the algal levels start to reduce in Wimbledon. The other thing that we need to develop, and that's going to come up for the next price review, is a revenue reward for people who farm clean water for us. We anticipate that going with their carbon income and their food production <coughs> income, so they have three types of stream, income streams to go for. 
That's in development. I'm trying out some early ideas with the farmers, and when I've got something that works with them, I'll try and sell it to the South West Water Board. I think that's the right way round to go, but if you disagree, do tell me afterwards. We have a kind of um, tracking process, so every month the progress on upstream thinking is reported to the finance director, and she makes sure that we're keeping on track with this work. Um, we're very proud of a PLC charitable third sector relationship. We're very proud that this work is happening on third party land where the farmers at any time can tell us that they don't want to play. But if it works, it works and that's good. So lots of tracking, lots of science has been mentioned earlier. And this thing is all based around the farmers' plans for the long term rather than what we want to do. Occasionally we get an award, which is quite nice. So um, chap on the left is a comedian, and I mean that most sincerely. But in the middle of the group, the, th the, th the very thin, well-exercised people are the ones running around doing all the work on upstream thinking. So that's really nice. Um, key points for the next price setting. We're doing full investigations of all our other water catchments through West Country Rivers Trust, and those are all going to plan and to cost. We're going to look at multiple benefits from the work and looking at these issues of drought and flood protection, effluent dilution, hydro generation, and then shellfish and bathing waters. But what I would emphasize is that everything we do is specific, starting on a field, then on a farm, then on a group of farms, and that specific catchment. And one recipe for one place will be completely different a quarter of a mile away, and it will be completely different for all the different water companies who are doing this or are developing further work on it. So upstream thinking starts right at the top of the catchment and it carries on, as you've seen through the other slides, all the way down to the sea. And that's this idea of embracing the whole system of food production, where people live, the threats and the risks, and the kind of environment that we want to see in the future. So to finish with, I'd just like to say thank you from our beneficiaries. Thanks very much. Um, it is quite, as Lauren said, the rest of my ear, uh, follow that after Martin. It's always a bit difficult to follow Martin. I, I can't guarantee I'm going to get very many laughs, because unfortunately the responsibility falls to me to take it to a slightly more technical level. We've had some very good overview talks today, but really the, the, the responsibility falls to me to um, get to undertake the next stage in the, in the um, payments for ecosystem services scheme development process and really this, this keeps coming up people are mentioning it which is that you, you can't really have a payments for ecosystem services scheme without having an understanding of what the situation is out there um, what the room for improvement what the headroom is in terms of actually delivering enhanced ecosystem services going forward because unless you can in, unless you can demonstrate that you are well convince people that you are likely to improve um, delivery of ecosystem services and then ultimately show that you have, people aren't going to necessarily want to invest. South West Water won't want to invest if we can't convince them and assure them that we are actually going to enhance the delivery of the, of the service. And this is what um, is called in the technical jargon of uh, assessing the prospects for trade. This is about building up a weight of evidence sufficient to convince the beneficiaries or the organisations acting on behalf of the beneficiaries to put their hands in their pockets and spend the money. And uh, the ex-estuary keeps coming up. We had a rather uh, good night on the, out on the estuary, so it keeps lots of pictures of the ex. Okay, so what am I going to do today? I'm going to take you through um, a story, really, about um, this, this uh, piece of infrastructure here. This is the Crown Hill Water Treatment Works in Plymouth. South West Water's a uh, bit of kit for cleaning water to supply people in, in Plymouth. And the key message here, as Martin's already said, is that for South West Water, when you have uncertain supply or reduced supply of water and its quality is uh, declining or low, and, uh, i.e. there's an increase in pollution, then this has implications for them at the water treatment works. Um, it manifests itself in, in that there's an increased risk for them um, and there's an increased cost implication of having to treat the water that they're receiving from the environment. So um, a quick overview uh, of, of how Crown Hill fits into the landscape. Crown Hill Water Treatment Works sits in 
It used to be north of Plymouth, but it's now well and truly in Plymouth. Um, and it has essentially, uh, it, it, it treats about 60 million litres of water a day for supply to um, about 80,000 households, 250,000 people in, in uh, South Devon and Cornwall. Um, it derives its water, its raw water, from three different sources. Um, the principal source is Burratall Reservoir, which sits on the slopes, southern slopes of Dartmoor. Um, and water from Burratall is fed by gravity down into a holding tank, a raw water tank, uh, at Robra, the Robra tank. And essentially from there goes down into the mixer tanks at, at the treatment works. The water from Burratall Reservoir has two additional pressures placed on it. Um, it, the reservoir is used to supply a small treatment works called Dowsland, which supplies this area around here with drinking water. And also water from Robra Tank can be transferred out through the South Devon Spine Main um, over to Totnes, where there's a treatment works called Little Hempston. Um, and what that means is that there's an increased pressure on the water from the reservoir in Robra Tank, and therefore southwest water are often forced to switch uh, away from the reservoir source to the two river sources that they have, the River Tamar at Gunners Lake, and the River Tavy at a, lock, at a tidal limit, Lockwell Dam. And as you can see, the Gunners Lake water is actually, into, is actually mixed at Rover Tank with the reservoir water before going to the works. So actually there are people who live in uh, Torquay who are sometimes drinking uh, Tamar water. Make of that what you will. Um, so that's, that's basically how it works at the bottom. So in the, in the wider scheme of things, if we actually look at the, in, the catchment for the treatment works in its entirety, um, you can actually see the scale of these, catch these drinking water catchments. And Lawrence has already shown this on, on some of his slides. Um, so here's the three sources, the, the Gunners Lake on the Tamar, the Tavy and Burrito Reservoir. And as you can see, uh, the, ta the Tamar is obviously a, a, a vast area where they're deriving water from. And obviously that has implications because there's all sorts of things that can go wrong with water before it arrives at Gunners Lake. Uh, very importantly, in the middle of uh, the Tamar catchment on the River Wolf is Roadford Reservoir, which Martin's already mentioned. There's a picture down here. This is one of their three big strategic reservoirs. Um, and that, that reservoir is used to augment the flow, maintain the flow in the Tamar at times where, if that resource ever uh, gets low. The blue arrows on here are some uh, few aspirations that Southwest Water have in terms of actually thinking about uh, refilling Roadford from the main Tamar, which has been with pump storage, and even perhaps using the vast resource uh, uh, on the, the Tamar represents and taking it over into Cornwall but these are only thoughts and ideas at the moment so we're starting to build up a picture of where this ecosystem service is being actually derived from so as I've said South West Water changed the raw water sources that they use at Crown Hill depending on various pressures and as you can see this is just um, the, just to illustrate over the course of a year they depend almost entirely in the winter on Burrito Reservoir for raw water um, the guy at um, the treatment works is convinced that you can drink the reservoir water as it is, and it's fine, I wouldn't recommend it. Um, and as you can see, as the, pre as the reservoir comes under, under pressure uh, in the summer months, because it has these demands from the dart catchment, uh, from the other treatment works on the reservoir, and so on and so forth, then southwest water are forced into swift, uh, switching to the, to the reservoir, so, uh, the river sources. But Changing the source, as I've already said, can have a significant impact on the treatment process. Cost, increased cost and increased risk. And that's because when you switch to the river sources, as you'll see, the water quality is, is less good. And that puts pressure onto this treatment process. This treatment process is designed to treat a certain type of water. When you put it under pressure, there's more risk that it will go wrong uh, and the treatment process will fail. And obviously there are cost implications associated with that. And this is just another illustration. Um, this shows the, the, the integration of the mixing of river water, as you saw before. And this is just a line showing the treatment costs. So you can see when they switch to the river sources, the treatment costs escalate significantly. So increased treatment costs. And that's, it, that's split into two. They, they actually, the, the, both the river sources, they have to pump. It costs about £300 a day to pump water from, the tape, from Gunners Lake up to the treatment works. Um, and, and then increased purification costs. What pollutants are, are we talking about? Well, we know the usual suspects. Um, all of these have some degree of uh, issue at Crown Hill. Um, the treatment process is designed to remove uh, as many of them as it possibly can, obviously, to meet the drinking water standard. So this is the key point. We need to determine the scale of the problems and where they are derived from in the catchment. 
if we don't know where the problem, how big the problem is and where it's coming from, how can we possibly estimate the potential for enhanced ecosystem service delivery? If you take nothing else away, then hopefully you'll remember that. Um, I'm just going to focus on two of these for the remainder of the talk, just taking through some examples of how we actually go through this process of trying to work out where the problems are and where they're coming from. And it's about risk assessment, really. And also it's about targeting our intervention. And as Hazel will talk about what we actually do when we find problems, it's about putting our farm advisors in, our, in the right place at the right time so that they can actually deliver the fund, South West Waters funding in the most effective possible way. Um, just some quick data. Um, if you think about suspended sediment um, and turbidity, turbidity is very important at the treatment works. They use the level of turbidity to, um, to dose coagulant into the water. So the, the, the higher the turbidity, the, the more coagulant they need. Uh, combined raw water, you can see the reservoir water has very low turbidity, but the river sources have far, far higher average turbidity, and they have these incredibly high spikes. This is actually a logarithmic scale on this side to give you a, an idea of how severe the turbidity spikes are on, on those rivers. And again, this is just the same, uh, showing the river sources coming in and showing the effect it has on the turbidity in the red line on the, on the turbidity of the combined raw water. Why does that matter? Well, there are these things called sediment presses. Um, when, when, the, when the sludge is removed from the water, dare I say it, um, it's pressed and dried for, uh, and using one of these presses. And uh, South West Waters staff at the treatment works say that they run the, their presses once a day when they're treating reservoir water and two, three, four, or even five times a day when they're treating um, river water. So quite a significant impact. In terms of nutrients, in particular phosphorus, again, this, the picture is the same. Um, the river sources have far higher levels of uh, soluble and total phosphorus. And actually, although the phosphorus nutrients aren't a particular problem in the treatment works in terms of the drinking water, um, it can have a huge impact on South West Waters infrastructure. For example, algal blooms in the raw water storage tank uh, at Robra can mean they have to drain it and clean it, which can have, when you're producing, treating 60 million litres of water a day, can have quite a significant impact on your overheads. So we know that pollutants can come from a variety of sources, um, and essentially we need to try and identify those sources, large and small scale uh, problems, and it's essentially risk assessment, starting at the, the coarsest level and working down. Um, and we need to understand the contribution that each source is making to the, to the raw water pro challenge that faced at the treatment works. Um, so point sources, the usual suspects and, and diffuse sources, urban runoff, agricultural issues, other land use. And we, you'll see this probably more than once today, the so, uh, source pathway receptor. This is the framework, conceptual framework we use to try and visualise how diffuse pollution is actually arising. Uh, it's a bit of revision, really. A pollutant becomes available on or in, in, the, in the land, in the soil, uh, mobilised, uh, and then moved to the watercourse to cause a pollution uh, along a pathway. I won't do that too long. OK, so revisiting the previous two, two subjects, we'll go back to suspended sediment and turbidity. We, we, all, we, we know what kind of activities, what kind of issues cause these pr problems, certainly in, a, in a, an agricultural landscape, um, management of soils, uh, management of livestock access to rivers and so on and so forth. And what, what we've done, I won't, I'm not going to go into the details uh, for the benefit of the translation, um, essentially we've come up with a conceptual, a qualitative model to try and uh, assign risk to bits of land, primarily based on their land use, um, weighted by our estimation of what agricultural practices are being undertaken, um, a consideration of the riskiness of the soil, the likeliness of the soil to cause a problem, um, and a hydrological model of flow over the surface or through the through the soil. So this shows a, a, an output from this from this spatial model showing um, our interpretation of where sediment is most likely. In our, I mean, obviously, notwithstanding practice, condition of the land. Um, given the basic characteristics of what we think is going on, this is a relative uh, riskiness in terms of availability of sediment for erosion. And we combine that with a hydrological model to give ourselves an overall risk assessment at a fairly coarse scale, but to try and understand where those factors coincide to cause the greatest risk. 
And if we have a look at one particular section that comes out, this is the River Ottery, which is a, sub, a subcatchment of the Tamar. We can actually go and have a look at, and assess the model to see how it's performing. And lo and behold, if you go out and inspect specific areas, you, you come across the problems that you were perhaps anticipating might, might happen. So again, this is about putting our, our farm advisors and our surveyors in the right place at the right time to pick up the problems. Um, actually, uh, APEM, on behalf of the Environment Agency, did a, um, a sediment pollution uh, walkover survey of the Ottery two years ago, and they found 653 sediment pollution incidents on the catchment, which uh, kind of ties in with the fact that it came out in our, in our, in our model as, a, as being a, an area that needed particular attention for this particular issue. And these are some of the things that they found. Sediment runoff issues, gateways, damaged fields. But the key thing here is that we're using the model to try and, quant try and get a feel for the scale of the problem, to target high-risk areas and assess the potential, therefore, for improvements that we might bring to bear. So in terms of nutrients, where do, where do they come from? Um, we've seen this picture already, it's quite a popular one in some regards, but um, nutrient runoff from yard, from farm infrastructure, silage, um, and then diffuse problems of actually spraying fertiliser of various descriptions onto the land and having it washed off, uh, point source and urban type runoff situations. So nutrients are derived from a huge array of, of sources and we need to try and understand what the contribution of each of those sources is, otherwise we simply won't know where to go and what to do. So this is um, some, some fairly simplified outputs from a model called Psychic, which is an ADAS model looking at um, phosphorus uh, loss. Um, this is a map just showing that where, they th where the model predicts point sources are likely to be occurring. That's no surprise, it's urban areas primarily. Um, some other interesting point sources appear. In addition, the model predicts um, manure or livestock sources of nutrients. And again, you can see that there's uh, some clear areas um, interestingly reminiscent of, uh, remarkably reminiscent of the sediment risk model as well. And then the model in this case combines everything together to give an overall risk. Um, but it gives us an opportunity to try and target our, our, our work into the right location to get the most for our, for our money. Just keeping that total phosphorus uh, export map in mind, we've, we can actually look at the monitoring data. We've done our own monitoring on the catchment and also also the Environment Agency do. Um, and you can see that this, these hot spots on the, on the risk map are reflected in the fact that the Upper Tamar and the Ottery, to a certain extent, uh, do have elevated levels of, of phosphorus export. Don't, everyone should notice the, 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 the River Innie and its interesting phosphate uh, result. This is true, um, and the Environment Agency are aware of why and are working to fix it. We won't dwell on that for too long. Okay, so the final piece of this jigsaw is how can we visualise, how can we start to understand what we might achieve if we, if we do upstream thinking, what, what, might, what ecosystem service delivery benefit might be our reward if we actually undertake this work. Because at the end of the day we've got to sell this concept to South West Water to get them to invest and offer and everyone else to try and get them to invest again. Um, there is a model developed by the University of East Anglia, a, um, a brain on legs called Toby Kruger, um, it's developed a model called ECM Plus, it's an export coefficient model, but what makes it different is that it's interactive and it's developed with farmers and landowners in the catchment. Um, it's ground truth and it, it, you can, he, he works very hard to ensure that it, it's true and it makes sense to the, to the farmers. And it's a very powerful engagement tool as, much as, as well as a quantitative, semi-quantitative tool for predicting outcomes. What it does is it predicts phosphorus export from catchments. Um, so here's, here's the Crown Hill catchment again. Um, here's the Tamar at the bottom, uh, the Gunners Lake at the bottom of the Tamar. Um, and there's a small water, single water body called Caldworthy Water, which you'll be hearing again uh, um, later on more about. Um, a single water body here. And Toby essentially run his model to examine phosphorus export from, the, from this small water body and from the catchment as a whole. So there's three scenarios. Scenario one is the current situation. And his model predicts phosphorus export from these two at these two locations. You can see that the, under scenario one, Cordworthy water is about three tonnes per year of phosphorus export predicted, whereas on, at Gunners Lake it's more like 70 to 80 tonnes for the whole catchment. 
So scenario two, 100% uh, uptake of best management practices on cordworthy water farms. So the best farming practices, there's a list of what are regarded, I think it was 44 originally, now there's 80 something, best farming practices, best management practices, which are designed to uh, help farmers uh, protect the environment, win-win advice, so on and so forth. And what Toby's model does is, because he, 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 it's interactive, you can change farming practice in the catchment hypothetically. So if you take the top 35 best management practices and deliver them hypothetically in the catchment, what do you actually, what's your reward? So scenario one is just delivering them within the cordworthy water. And you can see that there's a reduction predicted from three tonnes per year down to just shy of one tonne a year. So it's actually added giving us a quantitative, semi-quantitative indication of what we might achieve if we actually deliver a project like Upstream Thinking across the board. There is a tiny shift at, at, at Gunners Lake from doing that, just on Cordworthy, but hardly noticeable, as you'd expect, big catchment. So the final scenario is if 100% uptake of the 35 most popular best management practices on the whole of the Tamar above Gunners Lake, what might we achieve? Obviously no change at Cordworthy because it's already got 100% coverage under our scenarios. But what's the impact down here at Gunners Lake? And I've left a little marker in just showing you what the original value was, but it shifts it from about 70 to 80 tonnes per year down to below 50 tonnes per year. So, I wasn't going to say. That Toby, on his model outputs, puts the WFD classification colours on the background of his charts to give you a feel for where you are in WFD land. Um, that, that's fine. It's not the true WFD classification, though, so it's really just to give you an indication of, what, of where you are in time and space. The message from this is really that you can achieve, by working with farmers on these catchments, you can achieve, hopefully, we would, we would be quite certain to say, some degree of improvement. But it's by no means the whole problem. We know that there's other sources of phosphorus in this case which will be contributing, and there's a huge amount of work going on to quantify what their contribution is. But in terms of what we're doing, working with farmers, um, delivering on farm works, this is what we're, giving, we're, we're starting to put numbers uh, onto, or percentages at least, onto what we might achieve. And this is the information we need in order to sell this idea going forward. Um, there's a note on the bottom here, which most of you won't be able to see, but it was mainly to remind me that Toby is now working to, to engineer his model to work for sediment, fecal uh, indicator organisms and pesticides, hopefully as well, so that we can actually try and make predictions uh, about how they're reacting to our interventions as well. So, the final slide, just to really conclude, is that I, I think we are in a position, uh, at least conceptually and semi quantitatively, to quantify the risks and costs incurred at the water treatment works because of the, because of the pollution issues that are arising in the catchment. And we are hopefully also a beginning on the, on the path, the road, to assessing the potential for enhanced ecosystem services delivery, the where, how and by how much questions. Where, where are these problems coming from? How, how can we fix them? And how much gain, how much improvement are we going to get in our primary <coughs> ecosystem service that we're interested in, in this case, water quality for drinking water? And then also, how, how many other secondary benefits do we get? And that is the final information we need to go and sell the, the framework of upstream thinking to, to the funder. And we've got some other outstanding issues. I deleted all the pesticide slides. It would have been riveting, but I haven't got enough time. So thank you very much. The actual work is being done by lawyers. One of, um, through the uh, quite extended period of work that we've been doing on catchment management now, one of our key international partners is Keith Porter, who's a professor in the Cornell Law School. Worked for many years in their Water Resources Institute and was really the, the key person who brokered the New York City watershed program where the city invests with upland communities to protect the city's water supply. Uh, but he's now a professor in the law school, and two of his students, Sergio and Emily, have been doing, doing the detailed work to uh, sort out this information. Just in terms of background, we've had these two ReLU-funded projects. The first was quite broad, quite holistic, 
drawing on international examples of catchment management programs that work, trying to look at all of the elements that go together into a successful program. And we have a follow-up project where we're, where we're, we're a partner to the, the water project, and so trying to um, build a better understanding of the different elements that go into developing payments to ecosystem services type schemes. And so these legal tools are, are one aspect of that. But this is recent work, and it, it's to some extent still work in progress. So the outline is to just try and put this again into a, 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 a context, our specific research agenda on these legal tools, and then to talk about the comparison between the two main tools that we've identified, restrictive covenants and conservation easements. I'll try and slow down a little bit if I'm going too fast. Um, what are some of the problems and solutions? So this is just my way of putting this in context. Um, Lawrence had the nice little people, but the three key players, the land managers, the broker, and the beneficiaries or payers, um, the broker in the case of the West Country Rivers Trust is also a technical and knowledge provider, but they have other partners um, also providing uh, that, that technical and knowledge support. The, the, the agency will continue, the environment agency will continue to be a key player in that respect and also as, as a regulator. And I would argue that because of those complementarities between the regulation the, um, the provider saves, the, the voluntary conservation work, and the incentives that Lawrence emphasised with his three circles, you know, you, you've got to get the coordination, you've got to, to, to have a, a coordinated approach to catchment management to exploit those complementarities, and that needs the, the type of collaborative partnership working that, that we were talking about in our first project and is being um, rolled out through the catchment management pilots uh, at the moment. But that, in turn, is set within the, you know, the prevailing regulatory and legal framework and policy environment. You, you're constrained in your options by that environment, but it can also provide opportunities, and, and everything depends on the knowledge base that we have to support the activity. So our research agenda, what actual legal tools, forms of land management agreement are available, what do they do, what purposes do they serve, how effective are they, are they durable, sustainable, particularly because you know, we're concerned about long-term environmental protection or conservation? What are the problems? Are there solutions? And, and a theme of all our work is looking at the transferability of lessons internationally. The focus here, the US and the UK, but we'd like to extend this, and I, I know nothing about um, land management agreements in continental Europe. I hope they're similar, um, but that's a future the future agenda. There are probably still, this is work in progress, there are probably still quite a lot of gaps in our picture. So if anybody knows more about it than I do, I'd be really interested to get feedback and, on where some of the holes and uh, holes may be and, and some of the issues that we, we should be thinking about. So restrictive covenants, these are used in the US and here there are clause in a deed that limits what an owner can do on his or her land. Um, it should allow uh, 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 the surrounding owners to enforce those terms in court, in the law. It can be, it's often intended to enhance property values by controlling development or undesired land uses. There are a variety of uses, but we're focusing on environmental conservation. And this is really a contractual agreement between two parties. It doesn't necessarily involve a monetary payment. It's not a sale of interest. So a typical example would be where a landowner subdivides the property, the person might still live there, and so want to... Want... Sorry? Okay. So a typical example, the landowner may subdivide the property, the person may still live there, and so wants to have an influence on how his neighbours or her neighbours use that land. It might be a developer who sells, subdivides and sells those multiple lots. The buyers are buying somewhere with a nice environment. They're likely to share the objective of preserving that environment. So it's really a mutual covenant, a mutual agreement to protect the land. 
it needs to be registered so that uh, it, it, it is recorded and runs into the future. So one of the issues then is if in the law this is a contract between two parties, it's an agreement between A, the original owner of the land, and B, the buyer of the land or the buyer of that subdivision. So it's just seen in the common law as a contract between those two parties. Will it indeed, you know, but for long-term protection, what happens if B passes away and that land is inherited? What happens if B sells that land to B dash here? Will the burden on the land transfer to that new, uh, new owner, new user of the land? Similarly, the same thing could happen with A. A passes away, or A sells the land. Will A's successor continue to be able to benefit from the provision that was made under the covenant? In the common law in the UK, apparently the presumption is that these covenants are personal to the parties that made them and will not necessarily run to the successors in the land. And it's actually, I think, quite logical that that should be the case because these burdens could accumulate and they do accumulate over time. So they could become um, a restriction on the land market and the allocation of land as a productive resource that could become a constraint on economic activity. But there are recognised conditions under which that presumption can be overcome, and these are that the land that's benefiting should touch and concern the land that's burdened, and the land of the two holders concerned should be proximate. So I'll refer to these as the appurtenance requirements. I'm not sure how appurtenance translates into French. But the land needs to be nearby and there needs to be some physical connection, some physical impact between the two. And then we've got this point about uh, recording in a land registry and the point about not necessarily requiring a payment. So where, how, where are restrictive covenants typically used? They've been used a lot, apparently, in the U.S. by local authorities, I think to some extent here, um, with regard to uh, land that's contaminated, that's hazardous waste sites, where a restriction may be placed on that land to make sure somebody doesn't drill, drill a well for water supply or dig up all of, 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 the, of the contaminated uh, soil. And it seems that, in the U.K. at least, local authorities have some exemption from that appurtenance requirement. So the local authority may not actually hold neighbouring land that uh, is, is physically impacted. So that's something of an exception. In the UK, as I said, these things you know, can accumulate and become a burden. Apparently, something of the order of 79-8% of the land is affected by, by a restricted covenant of one form or another. Some of these may you know, be well past their sell-by date, people may have forgotten the origins. Some of you may own homes and you're not allowed to keep pigs because Lord so-and-so, 200 years ago, placed that restriction on the land. It's unlikely to be enforced now, but these things uh, often exist. The National Trust is an organisation that does make extensive use of covenants, because it's such a large landowner, much of that land is leased out and it wants to control how that land is used. Sometimes it will continue to hold and manage a pertinent land. In other cases, it doesn't. And under the legislation that set up the National Trust, apparently it also gains the benefit of, of effectively an exemption from those appurtenance requirements. The Upstream Thinking Project we've been hearing about, so I need to say a little ab about this. Southwest Water, through the West Country Rivers Trust, is grant funding typically 50% of the cost of improved farm infrastructure. For what they're calling conditional grants of over £5,000, Southwest Water and the West Country Rivers Trust 
require the farmer to place a deed of covenant on the property. Again, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm being so gender specific. In universities, you're taught not to do this. Um, these are actually started off as Sergio slides, and obviously in the US, they're not so sensitive. So his or her property. Typical restrictions would be limiting the livestock head. So, you know, a typical investment has been uh, a new slurry store or expanded slurry store. They want to make sure the farmer doesn't then just increase the size of the herd and run back into the problem of not having sufficient capacity to store slurry through the winter. Other, other common restrictions have included planting cover crops after harvest, refraining from planting maize in sensitive areas, uh, or maintaining specified uses of other elements of farm infrastructure, such as a, a manure store. From what we can see, the, the restrictive covenant is quite a robust and suitable legal tool to use for that purpose. And they are put in place for 10 or 25 years typically, which is linked to the expected working life of those capital assets. Not many of the farmers are planning to sell up in the near future. Um, if they were, they probably wouldn't, uh, uh, West Country Rivers Trust probably wouldn't enter into the agreement with them. So the point about it transferring to successors in the land is not necessarily a significant problem, but we've been talking about the fact that if the, P, the PES model can develop and start to be applied to perhaps longer term retirement of areas, perhaps to create buffer strips, to reinstate wetlands, then the, the durability and sustainability of the, these agreements starts to be called into question. Because West Country Rivers Trust and Southwest Water are not necessarily holding that a pertinent land in order to meet that condition. It might be interesting to have a test case as to whether the treatment works downstream could be considered to be touched and affected by what happens upstream. But I'm not sure in the common law there's been any, any case of that sort. Let's switch over to the US and look at the conservation easements. So these are an agreement between a landowner and another party that restricts development on the land, usually in exchange for a cash payment, um, but sometimes the tax benefits that property owners in the, in the US have been able to gain from selling a conservation easement have been sufficient to induce them to do it, sufficient to provide the incentive. It's a complicated picture because the law for this is determined at the state level rather than at the federal level, so there are 52 states and each one will have slightly a slightly different legal regime with regard to conservation easements. So 51, North Dakota is an exception. Um, there is a database that lists over 17 million acres, but it's estimated there that over 40 million acres are now covered by conservation easements. So that's two-thirds of the UK. It's five times the size of Britain. The, the, the number of conservation easements and the growth in this area is a relatively recent phenomenon, as shown in that chart, and particularly associated with these tax benefits. So landowners pay a property tax simply on the ownership of land. By selling a conservation easement, that land may be recategorized as open space rather than having development potential, and there is a, a, a very, or there has been, the reason that graph tails down at the end is because it's a tax loophole or a tax benefit which has uh, just decided to be closed off. But there are other benefits to this as a land management instrument. It's cost effective for the agency trying to secure the protection of that land, typically costing perhaps 40% of the cost of land purchase. It's attractive to the owners as long as they're willing to have that restriction placed on the land they, they can retain that land for their personal use. The agreements can be flexible, so they can be tailored to the individual purpose at issue. And this can have a, a, a solid degree of permanence um, for ecosystem service provision. 
What are easements used for? The largest use of conservation easements in the US has been for environmental purposes. But there are a range of uh, other purposes, but um, obviously what is environmental, what uh, many of these are related to environmental uh, benefit, but perhaps placing more emphasis sometimes on amenity value. They have been quite extensively used for the creation of state parks. So in terms of who's been buying easements, uh, nearly 50% has been the federal and state governments for uses such as uh, state parks, establishing open space, protected areas, but the, the third sector is also heavily involved in the purchase of easements. It's not necessarily about public access. Not all conservation easements allow public access. So, uh, you know, were this to be introduced here, that uh, it, it doesn't mean the right to roam being extended over, over farmland. What are the problems? Let's go back to restrictive covenants. One of the problems, the, the, the burden on the land, so the burden on B is recorded in the land registry, but the benefit gained by A is not. So this leads to the point that I was making about 200-year-old covenants being forgotten, um, or at least becoming a, a degree of confusion arising as to their existence and as to their purpose. I'm told that property law is a, is a very difficult and complex and rather dark art. Uh, there's a, a whole set of different rules about the benefits of burdens, and then none of them are particularly clear. So it would come down to you know, being tested in court in many instances to know what the particular outcome should be. There, there is a time limitation, so many of these things uh, may have uh, expired. There are no tax incentives. It's basically, they're basically arising on an ad hoc basis as an agreement between two parties, so there's no planned or strategic approach uh, for the purpose of environmental protection. And we've made the point about it perhaps being difficult to enforce over a longer time frame. And can it organisations seeking long-term environmental conservation meet those appurtenance requirements. Problems with conservation easements, there's a whole set of issues to do with enforcement. You can buy the agreement, effectively it's an unbundling of the property rights, so you buy part of the property rights associated with that land, but then the onus will be on you to, to monitor and to enforce it. So that's potentially more difficult than simple, simple ownership of the land. The critiques emerging in the U.S. suggest that those people holding conservation easements um, you know, set aside the land, the money for the purchase, but are not set as, setting aside sufficient resources for adequate monitoring and enforcement. And where there is default, similarly, they won't have the resources to go through an expensive court case procedure. Planning matters again. So, is this being done in a strategic and planned way, or is it ad hoc? And so can it be described as, as conservation sprawl? What is the definition of conservation purposes in order to gain those tax benefits? There's been a lot of controversy and cases, for example, of golf courses wanting to sell conservation easements so that they can get the tax benefits. But they're providing open space, they may be providing some habitat, they're providing recreation and access. When it comes to a court case, these things will be argued over in, in, in minute detail. What is the impact on the local tax base? This could go two ways. You know, there are concerns in the New York City watershed about the city buying conservation easements and that choking off economic development, which in turn will reduce tax revenue for local government. But it could also increase property values and increase tax revenues associated uh, with property. So it depends again on local tax regulations um, and the, the, the law associated with the conservation easements in terms of the, the tax benefits that can be gained. There are exceptions in the state law and the energy sector particularly, it's the US, you might guess this, the energy sector almost has um, a, a carte blanche, a, a, a right to overrule conservation easements and so the expansion 
of the gas fracking industry is, is having an impact. And in many states, um, putting in a pipeline for the gas can uh, uh, overrule any existing conservation easements. And there are, there, although these are potentially permanent agreements, there are problems in perpetuity if the original purchaser of the conservation easement disappears or loses interest, lacks the, the resources for monitoring and enforcement, third parties have no standing. And there have been court cases where third parties have said, this agreement, or you know, what was agreed under this conservation easement has lapsed and tried to get it enforced, but in the US courts they're considered not to have standing in order to make that case. Planning matters, so it's just a nice, uh, you know, does this blob of, uh, I put this up because it links to our concerns following from the Lawton Review about the need for environmental corridors and not just conservation sprawl. So in conclusion, just about okay, and again, this is very much work in process and I, I do need Keith Porter to um, go through this carefully and, and, and verify this for us. He has unfortunately been unwell, so he hasn't been fully able to do that as yet, but I think these are the, the key points that come out of this little study. Conservation easements are potentially better than restrictive covenants for long-term and spatially targeted protection. So is this an instrument that's lacking in the UK? Can environmental charities gain some exemption from those pertinence requirements, or could they work in partnership with local government to, to achieve this? If the National Trust has this exemption, why couldn't West Country Rivers Trust? For conservation easements, and this is relevant to the US rather than the UK, unless we could start to introduce and use these, there's a need to restrict, to carefully define, the purposes for which easements can be conveyed, and particularly if there are tax benefits associated with that. And um, we should try, if possible, to see them used as part of a package deal used in a more strategic and planned manner to avoid that problem of conservation sprawl. So this is just summarising our team and, and some of the key people involved, but, but thank you for your attention. Hi, Kate Snow from United Utilities. Um, thank you for a fascinating talk. Um, Martin, you put up a great picture of a barn for overwintering stock. Now, in order to prevent that farmer from bringing his cattle in and then going out and buying another herd to outwinter, you must have put some stock restrictions on, in which case he can no longer qualify for higher-level scheme agri-environment. So how do you compensate him for that? And the second point is one of reasonableness. When we've gone to court, the court looks at the reasonableness of that covenant. And often, if it's a big business against a small person, to be honest, we've lost in nearly 90% of our cases. Okay, thank you, Kate. Um, <clears throat> the first one is the stock point. Um, the stock level on the farm is the level that the farmer wants to run with in the long term. So there isn't a question of him running around the back of the agreement that we've made with him. It's entirely voluntary, and he agrees to keep the stock in through the winter, put them out in the spring when the ground's theoretically safer for the animals to be outside, and then bring them back in the autumn. So there's no conflict there because it's a voluntary agreement, and it shouldn't upset or conflict with any support that he gets from the government schemes. Um, the covenant principle, again, is voluntarily agreed. Um, there's no coercion by us. If we don't get it right, the farmer doesn't sign, and that's the end of the deal. So, so what, what's happening here is that it's a business-to-business -business agreement rather than a large organisation treading on a small one. We very much respect the farmer as the primary decision-maker and we're asking them to engage in something that makes them better off within a couple of years. That's how it works. I mean, we have to look on the worst side because we have yes. to be able to guarantee this to our customers for the best value. If he sells that farm, what is to stop the next person just chucking a whole load of more cattle out? Sure. Um, the, the covenant rests on the farm rather than the owner, but I'll just pass over to Dylan to give you the real facts and figures. 
this issue of development is going to come up when we were designing the system. Um, and, what, and what we decided to do was put in a duty under the contract on the seller to get, to get the buyer to re-enter the covenant before the sale is completed. So that if he doesn't get the, the future owner to, to invest in the covenant, he's in breach of his contract with us. So that gets around the appurtenance issue. And also, as Laurie said, there's this uh, issue where it could be seen that the covenant is touching and concerning the waterworks, which uh, you know hasn't been tested in law yet, but I would be very interested to, to see the outcome of that case. So there, there is a measure of protection if the farm is sold or inherited. Uh, it's Stuart Clark from, from Natural England. Um, forgive me if I don't express this in, in the right way because I'm not sure I've formulated it in my own mind properly. Um, and it may more, be more of a comment than a question. But um, I'm sort of struggling a little bit with this idea of um, the difference between paying for ecosystem services and um, effectively giving people incentives um, by a different route from... from you know, the traditional agri-environment schemes. And that's not to diminish you know, the, the fantastic work that's being done. But I think from a, if we talk about a provider, and if we think about um, farmers producing food, then um, essentially the more food they produce, the more they can get paid. Um, and I, I wonder how we can move to a situation, and it starts to become quite a technical question about, you know, how do you calculate how much carbon is being stored and how do you pay people accordingly? Because you know, only in that way do you then start to really um, reward those who are doing the right thing and doing more of the right thing, rather than just giving a basic payment. And that seems to me to be the big institutional block at the moment. And we seem to be able to do things around water because we have the AMP process, which is an institutional framework, and it's a mechanism for basically getting money from beneficiaries to providers but how do we deal with that kind of technical issue of moving towards a real sort of scheme which pays people for how much service they provide, therefore if you provide if you do more carbon and you provide more clean water you get more money and I sort of feel if we could do that that genuinely sort of moves us into the place where we are rewarding those who do the very best things um, rather than just kind of paying people not to do um, things that they shouldn't be doing I, th I think our, our position would be that we agree with you entirely and that that is something that we aspire to be able to do and we have always maintained that upstream thinking is an initiative to, re to reward people for going the extra yard over and above what's required of them by the law and, and in terms of basic minimum practice we would then try and we would always want to try and reward people, incentivise people to go over and deliver the ecosystem service over and above that baseline level. Um, so I think I think quantifying the delivery of ecosystem service is something that we definitely do aspire to. And in our in our catchment pilot on the Tamar, we've been we've had seven working groups and each one an ecosystem service with all the local stakeholders. And we've sat them down and we've spent three hours trying to get out of them how we might actually go about quantifying some of the, these less tangible services. But I don't think it's beyond reason to, uh, to hope, to believe that we can get to a point where we can quantify, we can have the evidence and data and information available to us which will allow us to quantify um, delivery of certain services. I mean, for example, if, if your service in question is, is recreation, um, then someone who is giving members of the public access to their land for example then that, that's quite easy to quantify and, and it's about identifying which types of land which bits of a farm or which bits of the landscape are delivering certain services and then making sure that the appropriate funding stream is targeted onto those parcels of land so a farmer may be receiving in, an integrated flow of payments based on the way that he's managing individual parcels of his land. I mean, that, that's the aspirational uh, place we want to get to in the future. At the moment, I don't think we're in a position with the data and evidence or, or with the farmers to, to be able to quantify ecosystem service delivery or secondary service delivery, but it's certainly something that we're working towards. And that ultimately has to be the ambition.
I'll just add very quickly that the old thing of raising lots of tax through the population, <coughs> laundering it through Brussels and then bringing it back again, isn't necessarily guaranteed in the long term. And if, if the European governments can't raise money to support agriculture, then I think this is a replacement model. And in making that transition from a, a, a compensation culture to a reward culture, there's going to be lots of heads knocking together and difficulties and distractions. But the principle, I think, is sound, that we want to pay people to produce a set of things rather than just loads of food, regardless of the environmental impact. Um, so I just uh, said that the, the evidence um, base becomes much more critical because if we are starting to pay people for quantities of services, then we need to be able to say with some confidence, you know, this management action will give you this much carbon and therefore we will pay you um, X pounds or you know, Y euros to, in order to do that. I think, yeah, so just very briefly, that, that's exactly what we're, I think Martin was going to say, that we are, the upstream thinking is how much water are investing significantly in what we, we would call our proof of concept. Sitting behind upstream thinking is this, the, the elephant in the room is we have to show, we have to be able to quantify the actual ecosystem service delivery that we have achieved and that's, and you're going to hear from Adrian Collins after the after tea about about can we actually quantify the delivery of the service in response to what we what we've done? So that so that's the obviously the next the next piece of the process, and that's you're going to hear about that after the break. So. Right. I think we'll just have one last question. Uh, thank you, uh, Ed Mogby, uh, Liverpool University and Tease uh, Rose Trust. Um, I'm, I'm intrigued by the the, the possible lessons and experiences uh, from the United States. And uh, just to reflect, reflect a little further on that, um, as you probably know, uh, Laurie, the, uh, the water policy uh, and wetland policy in the US is, is very much related to the requirement to maintain interstate commerce. And, and probably there's nowhere else in the world where there's such a strong regulatory framework that, that determines wetlands. And I just wondered if um, the, the team had considered the possibility of, of the, the other instruments which are used to, uh, to manage wetlands, in, in particular in relating to uh, mitigation banking uh, and the whole permitting process under Section 404 of the Clean Water Act, mm -hmm. uh, and how such things could be adapted uh, as, as a means of actually using legislation that does exist, but to to be more favourably disposed to, to actually uh, achieving the, the improvement, enhancement, or protection or restoration of, of Eastern services. Yeah, no, thanks for, for making that addition. In, in some ways, that's a story for another day, or if we have more time, because we are, we are looking with our, our US partners at some of those other mechanisms that they have, and it is um, the mitigation banking is a particularly powerful one because of that legal framework you just you described. Um, when we were there in April, we particularly visited a group called the Upper Susquehanna Coalition, which is a, a group of soil and water conservation districts, but as, as a network, they've established a wetlands trust, and um, they're very skeptical about the, using conservation easements, because they, they think it's just too difficult and too expensive to monitor and enforce them. But there's a lot of development going on, and particularly in Pennsylvania with the gas fracking. The developers, when they Im impair a wetland, have to pay for, for reinstatement somewhere else. And the Wetlands Trust is hoovering up that cash and buying land and, and reinstating or, or protecting wetlands with it. So it is a very effective mechanism there. Um, and um, in our work with the Water Project, we're trying to review and look at the potential for uh, mechanisms of that type. Well, thank you very much. Thanks to all the speakers again. Um, we'll break now um, for slightly less than half an hour. So